Hello, everybody. Welcome to the ABT Time Podcast. This, I believe, is the 38th or so episode. And this is going to be an extra special episode because this is going to be one great big reunion of uh, the two celebrating the two year anniversary of the launching of the ABT framework course, which we innocently threw together at the beginning of the pandemic, having no idea what it would grow into, which ended up being something very, very significant. We've got um, six of the veterans from the course. The, the first two rounds of the course were open to anybody who advertised it on Twitter. And the course involves 10 one-hour sessions. So we launched it on April 20th um, in 2020. And by the end of it, uh, it went so well that we just told people, you know, if you're smart, you'll actually do this whole damn course again. It cost 100 bucks, I think, that first time around. Uh, we raised the price a little bit with time, but we ended up with 14 of them, 14 out of the 50 did it the second time as well, which was kind of stunning. And so I ended up calling them the platinum club and we did a couple little separate discussions for them and kept, kept in touch with them. So we've got six of them coming back today, as well as one video recorder from a seventh one of them or no, it's maybe eight, I think actually with Alberta. So uh, hoping that she can maintain her uh, connection from Trinidad and Tobago, <laughs> extra special guest. And, you know, we we had, I think, four or five people from Australia. When I first announced the course, we set it for 11 in the morning Pacific time, not thinking of anybody outside the U.S. Next thing we know, we got a bunch of people from Europe and uh, all over the place, from Israel and from South America and then from Australia. And five people from Australia, the, suddenly I did the math and realized, wait a second, it's four in the morning down there. But they loved it and actually... Uh, Jen Martin ended up becoming the co-host of this podcast with me, and she loves to tell about when the course was going that that she just really enjoyed getting up at 4 a.m. The kids were asleep, her husband was asleep. She'd get a cup of coffee and then just sit and listen to everybody there over in this other continent on the other side of the world. So this is um, a little bit of setup first before we dive in and bring on the, our guests. The the milestone we're hitting right now is we just finished in March celebrating 25 rounds of the ABT framework course. So as I said, we threw it together there at the beginning of the pandemic. What, what had happened was there really wasn't any Zoom world back then. You may remember two years ago, we in March of 2020, as the pandemic began to close in on everybody and people stopped going out and doing social things, we decided to do one little experiment and said, let's do a free uh, story circle online and announce it on Twitter and had hoped we would get 25 people taking part in it. Uh, we ended up with over 300 RSVPs, which just stunned us like, wow, all these people are stuck at home looking for something to do. Let's think about scaling this up into a course, which is what we did a month later. And as I said, we announced it on a Monday on Twitter, said we were gonna book 50 slots and they were all booked by that Friday. So really tremendous launch to it. And then what we ended up doing because it was 10 one hour sessions in the beginning, we did it Monday, Wednesday, Friday, eventually shifted to Tuesday, Thursday. And it kind of matched up with month after month. It took about a month to do each round. And so we've done just a ton of rounds of the course. And eventually, actually, here is the, this is on our website, abtframework.com. And here is all the different rounds that we did, 24 rounds here. And then one other one we did with the business world with Park Howell. And you can see month after month after month, uh, each of those rounds. And this is, it's pretty monumental. I, th I think it'll take a year or two or three or four for people to really grasp what we did there because no one's ever put together something like this, a communications course iterated so intensely like this and built around a single model in which the model has been developed along the way. And so the six guests that we have here today, you know, they got a pretty different version of the course to where it ended up with this past March. I'll say a few words here about where it went with the, the basic model. And you see down the right there are all the different groups that ended up taking part in the National Park Service in particular were part of, I think, eight or nine rounds of the course. We eventually developed into doing some of the sessions. We split between two groups. We found it was kind of fun to mix them, especially FAA, Federal Aviation Administration. They ended up with their flight research center in, um, in New Jersey was kind of the epicenter for their participation and the ABTs that came from those folks were fascinating, you know, all about nuts and bolts and building aircraft and, and safety regulation. And then um, conservation group, five gyres, and then lots of government agencies and on and on, Smithsonian, yada, yada. 
Um, we also ended up accumulating a whole bunch of people that helped run the course and took part, none of whom were paid, all just did it because they enjoyed it so much. Uh, it really has been a tremendous experience. We, for the first probably 20 rounds of the course, we ended every one hour session with a conference call 15 minutes after the hour with whoever was present for that session. So usually about four or five people where we would talk anywhere for 15 to minutes to an hour about what we just heard in that session. And these are all the different folks. They're all on the website, um, abtframework.com. You can read about them and the, the four books that have come out of it, the Narrative Gym series. And this is what it eventually turned into. So again, this wasn't present there for the first two rounds of the course. As we did the ABT build exercise. So as you know, each round of the, each session of the course was an hour long, consisted of two parts. First half was a lecture from me or a guest lecture. And then the second half was usually three people working on their ABT, their one sentence and but therefore statement of a narrative of a project they're working on in which I would interact with them. And then the chat window, we would have people post comments. And as we did this over and over again, we began to realize there's a model here of how to go about strengthening these things that this model did not exist for those first two rounds. So for the six of you that are joining us today, you know, if you haven't read about this, it's in the narrative gym book but it emerged organically. You know, it wasn't like we set out at the beginning, we need a model. It was like a after a while, everybody began to notice, you know what? We seem to begin this whole process by always going right to the middle of it with what's your problem, going to the but statement, bypassing the and to start with, because you can't do this stuff until you get the problem locked in. Then from there you go backwards and then begin to work on the setup because the, it's the problem that tells you what needs to be in the setup and then the third element there is some fine tuning on the, the two turns, the but and the therefore moments. So this has turned into a very robust model that now lots and lots of people are using for this process of developing your ABT. And this is pretty fascinating here. This is what eventually emerged in the course. In the beginning, there was mostly just this and button, therefore the three words. We had a few details back then. But as we did these sessions over and over again, iterating, 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 we, if you do the math, there generally is about 30 participants in each round and 25 rounds. So that's about 750 people that have been through the course. And I've done ABTs with every one of them. So that's 750 ABTs that I've done. And the crazy thing in March, as we were doing the last few people, was just telling everybody I'm enjoying the ABT build sessions more now than ever before, because it's like puzzle solving. And it just got so fascinating in that regard. And I still, and now I'm missing it. It's been a few weeks since we ran the last round of the course, we'll fire up again, probably in September. Or so we got other activities we're doing, but this basically showing you flashing back and forth. We now kind of built this model that has a primary level, the simple and, but therefore, and then there's this deeper dimension of all these things we've added on the ordinary world, the stakes, singular narrative, the then tool, the what, what, how dynamic, the, but because dynamic and the general idea of, of framing all the extra add-ons um, that are the deeper level. And this is what now you go into detail in the course and pick up how each of these different elements works. And if you don't know those things, if all you're dealing with is and button, therefore that's nice, but you're kind of missing really probably 60 to 7% of the strength of it now, if you don't get these things. So let's see um, I, what we're going to do now is we, as I said, we have six folks that are going to be joining us. Then one of them who was booked today, couldn't join us uh, yesterday, we did a little five minute video recording with him where I had him just uh, address a couple questions. So this is Dean Penchef, who is um, with the Los Angeles County Natural History Museum and has uh, they have a huge grant from the National Science Foundation. So he took part in the first two rounds of the course and then ended up being one of the pioneers who went off and got funding from that NSF grant and eventually came back for, I don't know, probably it was February last year. It was one of the rounds then where they did an entire round with 30 people from the NSF museums program from all around the country. That was an excellent round. And he's just been a complete trooper on the whole thing. So I'm going to have him give this little opening setup and then we'll bring on the guests and I'm going to run them through two main questions, which is what'd you learn in the course and then how have you applied it? Um, and then we'll finish at the end with Julie Clausen, who was also part of the Platinum Club there. And another one like Dean, who went on to become a major part. In fact, she even more so than Dean in February or January of last year, she kind of joined our whole crew 
and has been a part of lots and lots of sessions and then brought in the fisheries uh, scientists from American Fisheries Society and Fisheries Conservation Foundation, I believe, and uh, ended up sponsoring, um, I think, one and a half rounds or so. But um, I'll ask her to kind of help give the grand synthesis at the end of our discussion. So let's begin here with um, listening to what Dean has to say. And uh, Matt, let me know if there's any problems with the audio, but here we go. This is about five minutes that that he runs through a couple or a few points. So here we go. Well, I am fine and hi, and it is great to be back and well to be able to say hi to my fellow Platinum Club members and uh, great to be back with you, Randy, and you, Matt. Okay, two things we want to go through here. First off, uh, what you got out of the course during the course and then what how you've used it since then. So first things first, tell us uh, what sorts of things hit you during the course. Well, the course has a lot um, of, of, of wonderful information. So I, I'll try to be super concise and mention just a few of the things that were, I think, most important to, to me and to us. Um, first of all, using the ABT template, using it in it, all its simplicity and richness has really helped us a lot to focus our discussions on how we put stories together, trying to get the word out um, to people about the work we do. Um, Another way that it has really helped us in the work we're doing is by giving us a common language that we can use to talk about these things. We're not sort of spending a lot of time talking about how to talk about putting stories together. Um, and finally, uh, we feel really empowered to tell good stories concisely. And that's been super important. Okay, that's excellent. And I'll probably ask one more question on that stuff. But then secondly, um, in the almost two years since then, how have you used what you got in the course? So we've used the, the training that we got in the course in some really productive ways over the last couple of years. When we first started doing this, we were just at the outset of a large National Science Foundation funded project to modernize specimen data um, in museum collections. This was a 19 institution grant spread all across the US. And so the challenge of communicating both within that project amongst the participants and to get our message out about the project has been really huge. So using the ABT, we were able to really effectively and efficiently communicate within the group to bring the message of what we were trying to do across all of the different uh, groups within the working groups within the, uh, the project. And that's been a really good and effective way for us as the steering group to be able to convey the messages that we needed to the participants. Has the, has, but, the, has the common language thing been a big part of that? Yes, exactly. We don't, we, when we're figuring out how we need to pitch um, something within the groups, um, we just cut right to the chase. It's like, well, how are we gonna structure this? What do they need to know? What's the, what's the pivot point? What's the but? And then what's the message we need to get across? And we don't have to talk about how or why or whether we're gonna do things that way. We just go. Um, you know so, what let me let me ask them does that feel at all different from anything you took part in two or three or four or five years ago or any, any past experiences does this feel more efficient as a result yeah absolutely it's 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 more efficient and it's more effective um because what we used to do in related kinds of things is and i'm sure everyone has had this experience you sit around in meetings and you talk about how you're going to talk about things um and you know then after an hour you kind of figure out how you're going to get somewhere um now we sit down and whatever the topic is, we know how we're going to structure our answer. We can talk about what, you know, what it is, the, the real message we're trying to get across, and we do, but we no longer have to spend time talking about how we might think about structuring this message. Excellent. And last thing, tell me specifically about the outreach and, and Instagram work. You do. Yeah. So one of the, because this is a large scale project, one of its mandates is, is to, to get information out to the public about the work that we're doing in, in, with these museum collections. And right now we've launched and have been running for something like six months, I believe, um, an Instagram um, feed that's multiple times per week. Each, each item is a little ABT. It's a little story about either a museum specimen that we're working on or the people who are doing it. But whenever possible, we're structuring those with a little bit of background, a little bit of butt, and then some little interesting um, uh, answer or solution or our piece of information about the problem. Have you ever had a week where you felt like, well, no, let's just make this one a big and, and, and thing instead of an ABT? Yeah, actually, and we do sometimes. I'll I'll confess in a sense because <laughs> you were things, supposed to say no. <laughs> I no, I, I I can't do that. But I'm conscious that we do that um, because sometimes it is just this is a specimen. This is cool. Look at this picture. Thank you. Goodbye. You know, and and we're okay with that. 
Um, okay. but, uh, but the ones that are about people, the ones that are about an interesting aspect, um, there we're, we're, we're trying to be a lot more structured. Excellent. Okay. And you got a final word of inspiration for anybody relative to the ABT? Yes, which is that the ABT is incredibly simple and incredibly fertile in the way that any good art is simple, but engages you and keeps you working deeper and deeper and deeper the more you think about it. Um, so it's, a, it's an incredibly simple tool to pick up, but I think you never finish working with it. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dean. Hope to see you again sometime soon. Bye. And I hope to be back with you guys as soon as I can be. Okie dokie. That was really, really good uh, of Dean. And it's kind of um, the, almost proof of concept there in that uh, Dean is a guy who is a taxonomist, system, systematics biologist, works in museums. And, you know, in the past, he can be pretty talkative. And when we started the course, he would sometimes go on long rambles, and especially we'd finish some of those sessions. And we used to let the chat go for another 15 minutes after the session was over, and he would sometimes go at great length. Um, he did such a good job there yesterday. We ran through, I talked to him a little bit about that, and we kind of gave it a little bit of structure there. And, and But here's the thing, this is really crucial. He was very easy to direct in terms of this is what I want you, I want you to boil it down to, you know, like three points. And I can sense that in people, you know, and he wasn't that easy to direct two or three years ago. Um, he clearly has absorbed it and he knows, and that was even great at the end, him saying that we know it now and we're doing a, an and, 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 and we do it on purpose. So that sort of awareness. Okay. On that note, then let's have everybody activate their cameras and microphones and join us. And we're just going to take turns going through a few of these little bits and pieces. And I'll, uh, I'll just do one at a time, um, give a brief intro to each person, let you just say the first thing, which is um, what what you get out of during the course. And then we'll go back through everybody and talk about how you used it since then. But, you know, what was your experience with the course? And, and keep it kind of short, you know, a minute or two, just to give us a little sample. Uh, let's start with John Rusho, who is at... Uh, I'm starting with John because you you and I have been buddies since back in shifting baselines 20 years ago, right, John? Um, Is it really that long? <laughs> yeah, my goodness, it's unbelievable. And you're with the University of Utah, is that right? That's correct. Okay, and then also affiliated with USGS. So just give us a few impressions and thoughts on the course and um, when you did it, and then later we'll have you talk about how you applied it. Well, probably the biggest thing I got out of the course was the feedback from the group and focusing on why should I care? What's what's the um, the singular narrative going into this and, you know, getting down to the don't look at what you've written. Just close your eyes and tell me why it's important, um, because that's, you know, I think the essential thing, because if you just start doing the and 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 with someone, it's like you're going to lose them. and I was at a conference two weeks ago and I had sat in a lot of uh, presentations where it was and, 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 and it's like, I see everyone around me dozing off, yeah. but the, the people that, you know, could actually, they had a narrative intuition. It's like, wow, they were amazing. So uh, that's, that's cool. Why, why in the world did you do the course a second time? Because I thought I'd get more out of it and I did. <laughs> All right. Perfect. <laughs> I, okay. I, I think it comes down to what you ended up with, with the narrative gym. It's like, this requires um, exercise. You have to keep doing it. So a second round of not just, you know, you nitpicking my ABT, but getting the feedback from everyone else and then, you know, listening to everyone else. So I mean, that, that was, you know, one of the really important things I think is like, it wasn't just, you know, like you and me talking via zoom independently, but it's like, all right, here's my two minutes, but then it's like, I hear 30 others. So yeah. it was, that was really important because it's like, all right, how do you focus on this? Yeah. The whole social dynamic part to it. Um, excellent. Okay. Uh, Linnea Dayton, uh, you and I have been buddies for a bunch of years. And then your husband, Paul Dayton is one of the legendary marine biologists. Uh, Linnea, you've been in the publishing world for a long time. Want to just give us a few tidbits of what, what you do with publishing? Sure. I started out just doing some editing and proofreading when my kids were little and running around and I could do it at home. And then I um, got into 
some deeper editing and some writing of books. I wrote a Photoshop book with two talented co-authors for about 20 years. We updated it every time the program updated. And um, so got a lot of experience writing how-to directions there. And then um, edited some other books and just got into thinking that I'd like to try publishing and see what that's like. Because in, in being in the publishing world, I felt like there was room for improvement on how things went for authors. <laughs> and yeah. so um, I have a small publishing company and um, I've been working with that. Great. And I think the, the question I'm going to hit everybody in this first round, first time through is the simple question of why in the world did you do the course a second time? I think that that brings out all the other attributes. So how about that for the starting question? Why why'd you do the course twice? Um, I did the course the second time because I got a lot out of the first time. And if it's worth doing once, it's worth doing twice, I figure. <laughs> <laughs> it sort of some cements it in there. And okay. um and I think back then it wasn't evolving so much as it has since. So I feel like having been a participant in some of the story circles, I, well, I don't know if they're called that, but when people present what they've done for their ABT, um, I could see that it was getting ahead of where I was. But, uh, but I just thought it was worth going over it again and getting some more practice. That's great. Okay, excellent. And then um, let's move on. Well, so everybody's just getting a little opening teaser here. And uh, how about Chris? Uh, you were with the University of Missouri when you did the course. And now tell us where you are. And then I'm gonna hit you with that same question of why in the world you did it twice. But uh, yeah, where, where are you with? Uh, who are you with now, Chris? I was at the University of Missouri when I took the class, and now I'm uh, the Dean of Science and the Chief Science Officer at the New York Botanical Garden here in the Bronx. Wonderful. Uh, and why in the world did you do the course twice? Uh, the community, the people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I was watching Dean's recording with this NSF Museums grant, and I'm like, I'm totally going to email him for a copy of his proposal, and like, I know he'll <laughs> totally send it to me. <laughs> or, you know, I, I know I could contact anybody here. And so, so yeah, I think the community of people, and like John said, I think I learned more watching other people having their ABTs dissected than my own. So that actually was quite helpful. You know, there was an element of faith that happened with the whole thing, because um, I, I like to say nowadays, I've been working on the ABT framework for 10 years. The first five years were what I call slow boil as I began getting it out there and, and you know, say, is this thing really as powerful as I think it is? testing the waters. The second five years was medium boil, where we did story circles coming off the Houston, we have a narrative book. And the story circles teaching was kind of medium speed, because it was only events that we would do demo days, like three or four times a year, and you go to a place, and it would just be one day thing. And people would kind of catch fire, and then it would, would die down. Uh, and then it was like, we were primed and ready for two years ago, when the pandemic hit, where people wanted more social interaction, all stuck at home, the Zoom thing caught fire and worked. And Gemini, it just really did all come together. And the proof is in the 25 rounds that it ended up doing and is booming more now than ever before as we continue to spread outwards. Um, so that's really good to hear. Okie doke. Uh, let's see. How about next, uh, Kara? And how's about if you share with us? Um, same sort of thing. You were with Brookhaven, or you, you're still with Brookhaven. Tell us your position and, and same question of what made you do the course twice. So yeah, I'm at Brookhaven National Laboratory and I do science communication for the laboratory. Um, so I write for the general public about science, but I also work with our researchers here to help them prepare for conferences and presentations, which leads me to why I took the course twice. The first time I took it for my own work, but the second time I wanted to learn from one of the masters how to teach other people to use it. <laughs> so, and that's what I've been using it for, explaining that's it to my researchers here, right outside those doors, how they can use that for presentations, posters, proposals, however they go out in the world to show their research to others. Excellent. Okay, cool. Um, and let's see, Ellie, you, um, you and I've been in touch for, you actually came and did a Story Circles demo day at USDA, probably around 2015, I would guess. And let's Thanks. see, Ellie, are you there? Why don't you tell us 
um, same sorts of things. What sort of work you're doing right now and why you did the course twice. So when I took the course, I was actually uh, a uh, postdoctoral fellow with the Oak Ridge Institute of Science and Education appointed at the Narragansett uh, EPA office. And there was such a great alignment with my research because I was working on the effectiveness of water quality communication. And I had not dwelled in the effectiveness of, of communication uh, before that. I was just working on social science and extracting local ecological knowledge and dwelling on, on the word of effectiveness. I, I just welcomed the opportunity to do the course. And the second time it was, well, my postdoctoral uh, appointment ended up being all during the pandemic. So it was, it was just a great, it was community for me. And it was also uh, putting in the, the narr narrative gym, uh, connecting with people and learning more over and over again. That's wonderful. Okie dokie. And then our final guest, uh, Julie Claussen. And Julie, give us a brief intro of all your great work in fisheries. And then you not only did the course twice, but then came back and became part of the course. Uh, Julie, are you there? I am. Um, so I'm a fisheries biologist. I've been at the University of Illinois as a, a research associate for many, many, many years. But then I really pivoted and now run a, uh, a, a foundation, Fisheries Conservation Foundation, which is an NGO, which is really working to link um, what the science side is doing in fisheries science and taking it more to the constituents and the public. So that's why, you know, communication for me was um, really vital to continue my growth in, in that. And so really the first time taking the class, it was just these wow, 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 wow moments all the time. And the second, taking it the second time really allowed for more reflection. So instead of it like, wow, this is so great, you know, you could really think and just absorb it a little bit more. So it was, um, it was fantastic. And then I will agree with Chris that that connection, that community that we built um, with that first group and, and uh, continued with. with and, and you know what else was, um, so we did the course all through 2020, starting in April that year. And then some of the, the faculty we get, began to have giving um, their sessions over and over again, um, began to get a little swamped with other things. And not, it wasn't like we were losing momentum, but all of a sudden in January last year, both Julie and her buddy, Marlis Douglas, who's a conservation geneticist, both joined into the course as part of the staff as well. And they brought with them this incredible new jolt of energy and enthusiasm and took part in so many of the conference calls. And I owe them an enormous debt of gratitude because that energy is so important in working on this stuff and everything. This is what goes on with the course. As I say to people, if, if there's a lot of public relations that needs to happen when people get ready to do the course, the more we can get your participants fired up to come into this thing with a lot of energy, it's just like going to the gym. You can't take bored, distracted, worn down people to the gym and expect them to do a good workout. They got to come running into the gym and hit the equipment and really throw everything into it. And it's all this giant feedback loop. So, um, okay. And then one more of our guests, uh, Alberta, who has been one of the tried and true troopers coming to us from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Trinbagonian is, is not the word. And Alberta, are you there to share a few thoughts with us? Yes, I'm here. Glad to be here. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, tell us why in the world you did the course twice. Well, at that time when the pandemic had hit, I was looking for opportunities to improve my science communication skills. And I had heard about Randy in one of the courses I had done previously. But I had never met him personally. Therefore, I jumped <laughs> opportunity to meet a scientist and filmmaker, as I'm hoping to walk in his shoes as well. <laughs> and you enlightened all of us on the biology of pigeon peas. Um, and and what, what's your position there these days? What Are you still working on pigeon peas? Yes, I am. At the point when I came in, I was, may have just conducted one interview. And so I'm almost finished interviewing scientists, farmers and pigeon pea lovers. And 
going to start, hope to start moving into the editing process <laughs> here as well. Wonderful. And, and if I could put in an added plug, well, through the ABT course, I would have also met uh, Brian Palnemo and uh, I decided to do some extra training with him so that I could be comfortable with interviewing and connecting as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I'm Brian Palermo, our improv guy, my co-author of the Connection book, and one of the long-term troopers of the course who's done probably just about all 25 sessions he's been a part of. So um, yeah, that's tremendous. Okay, so now we're going to move on and um, run through everybody again. And this time, uh, we'll just cycle through again. Uh, John, let's start with you. And this time now, give us one, two, or three actual applications. You know, the power of storytelling rests in the specifics. That's what we all know. So give us a, a few specifics of how you've used the ABT in the past couple of years. Well, the, the most recent one was putting together a poster for that conference I went to um, because it's like, all right, I want to make sure this is gets the point across and, you know, telling people why they should care and whatnot. And it was just trying to focus on the one thing that I really wanted them to learn about. So that was interesting and, you know, it helped me simplify my poster and whatnot and get that presentation going. Um, you know, one, one thing interesting to me, you made, made a mention there early on, 10 years ago, when I first started going out and talking about the ABT. I, I expect everybody to just connect to the ABT, but I was surprised how many people came up and talked to me afterwards, not just about the ABT, but also about the and, and, and. And they said, I, I'd never known that there was a wrong way to do it. And being told about this and, and, and structure, I realized that's what I do a lot. I thought, it, and, and I always say, you know, there's nothing wrong with the and, and, and it's just suboptimal. There's a better way if you can push further to get all the way up to the ABT. But that's been a major learning point. And, and then hearing you talk about it a few minutes ago, you said you were at a meeting and just listening to all these and, and, and things. I, I get so many text messages from friends, you know, they're in sessions and they say, oh God, I'm stuck in and, and, and hell, whatever. Uh, so just identifying that has also been a, a contribution. Uh, one other place that you've you've used it? Well, so this wasn't necessarily, you know, when I'm using it to communicate directly, but I will say that when I was sitting in that conference a couple of weeks back, I started counting ands and buts in some of the presentations because I knew I was tuning out. And obviously, if I'm starting to count, you know, ands and buts, it's like, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it, it was interesting because it's like I've seen people tune out and it's like, all right, why should they care? It's like they're just rattling things off. And like you've said in the past, it's like and 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 works well with, you know, your group of people that they're already committed to this. They already know about it, but you can still lose people. So, you know, getting the why should I care? And then the but part of it is I mean, really important, especially, you know, most of those presentations were less than 12 minutes, but I mean, they were boring. Yeah. But, you know, that's the thing. Mike Strauss loves to talk about lightning presentations that um, even in a one minute talk, you can bore people. I mean, it doesn't take much at all to, to bore people. Um, and actually a little teaser preview of coming attractions. We have got a research group that we've put together here of about six or seven of us, including Julie and Matt in which we are now hard at work on a paper we're going to publish somewhere about the two narrative metrics, the butt to and ratio and the and frequency. And we've used those both so much now in the courses and it's crystal clear. It's a piece of science that needs to be out there in the public realm for people to be using it because we've got three big data sets, which is broad popular articles and then research articles and then government or NGO reports. And you see the gradient very clearly. The broad popular stuff taps into the butt to and uh, dynamic. And at the other end, the these boring reports are just giant and 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 it's unbelievable. The, the proliferation. And this is what that World Bank example that I talked about in the course is about. You know, when you get people that don't have anybody cracking the whip on them for narrative structure, they just de default into massive numbers of ands and everything grinds down. So okay, thanks very much, John. Uh Linnea, have you got couple of um, specifics on where you've seen or used the ABT? Yeah, um, I do. Over the past two years, I've done more editing than writing. And I use it there a lot to help um, 
the people, the authors that I'm working with make their uh, writing more compelling. And um, I wanted to mention something that I noticed when we were doing the, the ABT statements and reviewing them in small groups. And, and um, I come from a science background. I, I don't think I mentioned that, but I was a zoology major through a master's degree. And, and I think we were just trained to write that way. And that was, if you did that, that was the right thing to do with all the ands. <laughs> and um, I would get the ABT that we were gonna be working on. And the first question that occurred to me and one that I would ask when we met was, who is this for? Uh, who are you talking to here? And what would you like them to do as a result? And um, I did find that often with people who are just taking the course for the first time, that was led to about 10 seconds of silence while they <laughs> thought about it, you know? Yeah. Possibly because they'd written it the way they were taught to write. And um, so that was interesting to me. And I think it was helpful. Um, also, I wrote, I, I was thinking just this morning that I'm using this also in, in writing fiction, I think, and you don't, it isn't the and, and then the but, the most powerful word in the English language, and then the therefore, but you can do things like, here's what's happening in the scene, and then there's internal monologue, and that's the but. Mm -hmm. Um, part and and so I would like to look at fiction a little more and dissect it that way. Yeah, um, have you seen the 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 book that I did? Uh, Narrative is everything, which not many people have seen. I just kind of threw it out there, self published. But I'm, I'll I'll send you a PDF of it. Um, okay, great. It, it's packed full of a whole bunch of those metrics that I did, looking at lots of of novels and things like that, and seeing huh. those patterns. And you, you see interesting things in there. One of the interesting little tidbits is. Turns out Hemingway, his and frequency is enormous for artistic reasons, because yeah. when he wrote The Old Man, the Sea and other things, yeah, it was a stylistic thing he did. And the day was calm and the people were milling around and the seas were this and that and 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 that way artistically. But he's an outlier with that. And there was a documentary, Ken Burns documentary, I think, done on Hemingway. And they even made mention of that, that he used the word mm -hmm. and stylistically. So that's pretty interesting. But. Lots okay. to be said on that. So great. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Chris, how about one or two little examples specifically of how you've seen or used the ABT? Yeah. Well, like Leanne just said, I think I use it a lot every day, just as an evaluator or a teacher or a coach talking to my people, you know, in science, we're pretty strong on but and however, you know, but then we're pretty weak on the and and therefore piece. And so like, once you get the but right, then you can do the other uh, two pieces. So I agree with, I agree with Leanne. I'm always like, so what's the, and like, what's your hook? You know, how are you drawing in your audience, depending on the audience? Um, the second way I used it actually here at the New York Botanical Garden, when I was addressing the board, I had a lot of different audience members, right? The board, people who work at the garden and the scientists. And of course the board wants to see you to shake things up and do a lot of changes. And the scientists maybe maybe they don't want to change so much <laughs> and other people are really. And so what I found myself doing was, was, was doing a version of the ABT, which is past, present, future. Right. Yes. And so I would say, well, in the past, we've had a strong legacy of doing this, but we did change along the way over the last 150 years. So there's a, but in there, right. right. And, yeah. but we did change, yeah. but, or however, and maybe you don't say, but you actually say, and versus, but just so you don't flag it, but, but yes, Today, natural history museums have to adapt to the world we live in, you know, to social justice, to not just biodiversity, but climate change, you know, things that you find on the cover of the newspaper. Therefore, we are going to adapt together, adapt together as a team to do blah, 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 right? And so the other transition there is from like a me to a we statement, right? How fast can you go to the button therefore with the, the group? So anyway, I've been thinking about that a lot. And when I talk to our marketing and development people, they like, you seem to understand this narrative thing. And I'm like, well, I've you know, been doing it for a while, but I have this, <laughs> this, this three-part this three narrative is quite easy 
for somebody to get in five minutes. But as Dean said at the top, it's easy to get it in principle, but in practice, it takes a lot of practice, right? So yeah, I, yeah, found, I, find, I found it very helpful. That is excellent. And another little teaser of the study that we're doing. Um, when you look at articles in the New Yorker, they almost never use the word however. And as a result, I've just, you know, said to be, well, however is trivial. Um, but when we started looking at these research articles from one journal, um, Marlis Douglas had warned us. She said, scientists use the word however a lot. And sure enough, we're able to show you quantitatively they do. And I think that's reflective of them not wanting to argue forcefully. Right. Yes. Well, Just, that's what I said at the top was actually in my talk, my, my, you know, people around me were like, Chris, don't say, but, or however, say, and even though it is a, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and so it, I found myself saying, okay, in my mind, I'm saying, but, but I'm saying instead of, but we need to change. I'm like, and we need to change. Well, and, that, and that's, you're getting you know? the, you're getting the, but dynamic out of the inflection of your voice. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's that's really interesting. I hadn't even really put much thought into that. So uh, more things to be dug deeper into. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Cara, uh, you got one or two thoughts for us on how you've used ABT or seen it? Yeah, I mean, it's in every first paragraph I currently write. Um, <laughs> and throughout the rest of the story. Good to hear. And um, I think the biggest customer who's currently getting my ABTs is the Department of Energy, because as a facility who's uh, finance through them, we have to send them science highlights that are about certain research we do here. So any kinds of papers that come out and they would like to have them in 200 words short, nicely explained and wonderful. ABT is there for you to, to, to solve that. That's excellent. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you've read up much because it came along after you guys did the two rounds, but the if then tool um, that emerged from a graduate student from Colorado State University that I helped a little bit on her dissertation and she and I together stumbled upon, wait a second, you know, sometimes you really need to get more explicit with the if then dynamic, namely saying, if we do this research, then here's all the great things that will come out of it. And I think one of the shortcomings that happens a lot, especially with scientists is this assumption where everybody knows why this stuff's important, you know, and of course we got to do it. And the if then tool helps you really articulate that. And that was one of my biggest problems back when I was a scientist. I know without a doubt, my first seven NSF grant proposals got rejected. And I just had a tendency to say, give me the money. We all know this is important. And you can't do that, apparently. Um, I think it, I learned so well over the years from that. That's where the if then thing is really powerful. And it's, it's stating the obvious, which a lot of scientists hate to do, but you know, you kind of would rather err in the direction of making sure everybody's on the same page as opposed to, well, I thought they all knew this. So uh, very, very interesting. Uh, great to hear on that. Ellie, um, you got any thoughts for us? One or two applications or instances you've seen of it? Yes. Well, like like everyone else, just using it in my, my scientific writing and being more critical of my writing and how I structure my narrative. Um, that's that's one, and then I I'm over overly excited all the time, and I'm always sharing with everybody about you need to hear about this, and I send them you know one of the clips and says you have to look at this. Nice. Um, I did get a chance to present at a conference, so I I, I presented the entire uh, ABT framework structure at the Coastal Estuary Research Federation, hmm. and it was a a panel for uh, science and inclusion. And we had a, an Alaskan elder, and it was just a, a very knit uh, group of people. And I, I framed it in the importance of being able to talk to our outer circle, uh, the difference that, that ABT makes when we're communicating science within our inner circle. And if we want to be inclusive, we need to be able to share what is at stake and what is the solution. So bringing the outer circle uh, in, inward by using the ABT narrative, and it was well received. I had a I had a, a good good questions after that. Yeah, that that's excellent. And one little anecdote you just made reminded me of the very first big audience I ever presented ABT to was in 2010 to the Alaska Marine Science, or maybe it's 2012. I think Alaska Marine Science Symposium they have in January in Anchorage, that which was a thousand scientists in this big ballroom. Uh, it was the first time I ever presented the ABT. And the day before, they had me take part in a workshop with, um, I, I've forgotten the program, but it, it was an outreach program uh, with Native American elders and communication, that sort of stuff. 
And they had one of them come up finally towards the end of the day and asked him to tell one story from, you know, their culture. And I sat there kind of trembling like, oh, no, what the hell is this going to go? Is it going to bear any resemblance to ABT? And honest to goodness, the guy told the story of this guy went out fishing on the ice and was towing a sled behind him and caught a bunch of fish and got ready to go home. But then he turned around. There was a big crevasse <laughs> that had formed. And he couldn't get back. And it was perfect. It was a whole ABT suspense. But therefore, he went down the coast and he didn't use the words, but it was exactly that form. And I sat there relieved like, yes, there it is, even in good storytelling from cultures, uh, Native, Native American cultures. So that's excellent. Thank you very much, Ellie. And we're going to have to wrap this up because it's a podcast and we just wanted some little samples. I wish we could go on for a couple of hours because everybody's got so much to, to share here. But I've asked Julie to kind of give the final wrap up here. And Julie, a um, little bit of synthesis thoughts on what you've seen, because you've really kind of got the Alpha Omega experience from that very first round in the Platinum Club and then being a part now of this little project that we're doing. And your energy level enthusiasm just continues to amaze me. So Julie, take it away for a few minutes here to pull it all together. Sure. And, I, you know, I think this group is really the testament of, of how we were all hungry for something. You know, it, it, it was a bit of a perfect storm. Um, there was the pandemic. There was a need for connection. There was some political things going on that is just, you know, how do we communicate better? And I think we were all um, hungry and we connected and we took the course twice and, you know, just really felt that impact. And so, um, you know, just to emphasize some of the things that, that um, we've all brought up, you know, the efficiency is something that really hit me when I was taking the course and Dean and, and Cara have brought this up as well. Is it just when you can speak a common language, when you can, you know, start your day with the structure, what's my ABT for the day? What's my ABT for this project? It just makes you so much more efficient and, um, and feeling organized. Um, I loved what Dean said and Chris um, uh, talked about this a little bit more, this simple but fertile, you know, and it plays right into the gym analogy, right? Because you go, working out is simple, but you use different tools, you work out different muscles. And um, I, I love that simple but fertile um, statement. Um, you know, and, and what um, John and, and Chris said, you know, really figuring out what the problem is. We all have been there when Randy says, what's your problem? And we're like, well, I think it's this. <laughs> and just, um, you know, that that challenge and and realizing that people talk and talk and talk. But when Randy says, what's your problem? You can't say it in five words is a is just a, a, a light bulb moment. That's like, OK, that's you know, that's where we have to start. Um, and, uh, you know, what John said about this growing intuition that, you know, you learn it, you take the class twice, you start using it, you start using it. But as you start listening to other talks and other, um, uh, other presentations or, or reading that you just start picking up on that intuition of, oh, this is good narrative structure or this is a really bad narrative structure. So um, that um, has been pretty amazing. Um, I loved what um, Linnea and Ellie said about audience, um, because when you take the course, you know, a lot of times it's, you can frame it this way, you can frame it that way, and that inner circle, outer circle, and that is something that um, I know personally I have really paid attention to, is how am I framing it for this audience? And um, as we all know from the working circles, that is something that we really look at pretty, you know, ask and, and talk about quite a bit. Um, and then I'm um, just finished with, with what John said about why should people care? And I will never forget the one of the, it might've been the first class when Randy said, no matter what the topic, no matter what you're talking about, you can make it interesting. There are no boring topics. It's just how you present it. And that has really stuck with me. <laughs> And so, you know, even if it's really challenging material, um, how can I make this interesting? How can I use this ABT and, and content and all the things that we learned? So, you know, when John said, why should people care? I think that is just really the crux of no matter what we work on. You know, we're at a time in our lives where there's just really, really critical problems, whether it's biodiversity, whether it's climate change, whether it's politics, that um, this isn't just a communication thing that, that um, you know, is nice to use. It is imperative. We all become better communicators. I'm so glad to hear you say that because that, that, you know, it's sort of a low self-esteem statement to constantly be telling yourself, if only I were good enough, I could make this interesting. 
but it really ought to be in everybody's mind, you know, rather than to just dismiss thing. Well, that's just something no one could ever get interested in. Um, that's the easiest way, you know, possible to just give up on things. So um, two last little things we're going to do here is the final comment from Alberta. Are you still there? Because um, we don't have your video. I, I keep uh, skipping you. But Alberta, can you give us um, one good application? I think you already did a little bit of the ABT. Yes. Well, I've been using it constantly. As I said, emails and WhatsApp messages and even in my application for different science communication positions, I always remember the and, but therefore to make it convincing and impactful. And in fact, I even did a working circle <laughs> this application. You, you've done a lot of working circles, haven't you? I've, I've, over the past couple of years? Yes, I have. So it's sort of like, as Julie said, become part of your day. So <laughs> That's you hang right. out where you rest your communication information so that it could fit and fall nicely in place. All right. Someday I'm going to make it to, to Trinidad and then we can run our in-person ABT workshop. Should we do that sooner or later? <laughs> yes, Trinidad and Tobago. So that'll be two batches of workshops. Okay. All right. We'll schedule them both. Excellent. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Okay. The final last little thing I'm going to do here, it's going to take two minutes, but I want to share with everybody here um, this video that we are working on that we'll probably have a finished cut of in the next week or so. And I think you're all going to want to use this in trying to get the word out to other people to, to convince them what this is all about. This has come together in just the last two or three weeks. This is a rough cut of it, but let's see, Matt, let me know if this has any problems sharing sound. Go back to sharing here and hopefully this. And uh, let's see there. Can you see it, Matt? Looking good. All right. So two minute video, and I think you'll all follow it. And uh, let's see, here we go. At the heart of effective communication is narrative structure. If it's strong, the communication will be powerful. But there's a problem. Getting the narrative structure right involves work, which is a burden. So the question for communication is, who will bear this burden? You or your audience? This is the tool you need for the job, the ABT narrative template. Working with it is just like solving a puzzle. In fact, take a look at this jigsaw puzzle. What's it a picture of? It looks like parts of a girl's face, a man's tie, some wood paneling. Feels like maybe a Norman Rockwell painting. It's the same as a text that lacks narrative structure and has what we call the and, and, and form. Show it to an audience, they'll have to work to make sense of it. Now, invest some time and energy and you might get the puzzle to here. This is equivalent to the first draft of the and, but, therefore, ABT form. You now have the beginnings of a story as we see the picture is centered around a little girl. It's still not quite clear what's going on, but it's much better. Then you put in a lot more time actually solving the puzzle. And boom, it's a girl, she's got a black eye, she's waiting to see the principal, and yes, it's a Norman Rockwell painting. Your first draft an audience would find confusing and boring because you put the burden on them. Your first ABT draft at least starts to hook their interest, but you weren't done. This is the problem of so much poor communication, going to the public with basically half-baked goods. When you finally go the full distance to the completed ABT, when you solve the puzzle, when you take on the burden, that is when you finally communicate powerfully. And by the way, most really bad movies produced by Hollywood, this is exactly what happens. They fail to solve the puzzle. They just go ahead and release a mess like this. So in the end, you need to know two things. First, understanding narrative structure is essential for communication in order to not bore or confuse people. And second, it's identical to the solving of a puzzle. It takes time. Your time. And there we go. So that is our project of the day. And um, I'll get it to all of you. Yay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think um, we've got John rail in austin working on a much nicer graphics it'll be sharper and smoother than that we'll have a little bit of music in there but um it'll be something that you can show to groups that you're trying to get them to understand that's the whole challenge as you know it's that time thing just getting people to accept that no you're not a natural i know your whole life everybody's told you that you're incredible but 
you know, it's, it just takes time. So um, let's see on that note for us to all say farewell, keep in touch, everybody. It has been so much fun the last two years, a great, great course and uh, lots more ahead. And yeah, uh, don't hesitate to send me emails with questions and you want to have discussions on things like that or more activities to do. So thanks and see y'all sometime soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>